This episode of Chats with the Chatfields is brought to you by Full Bucket Veterinary Strength Supplement. Welcome to Chats with the Chatfields. This is a podcast to expand your idea of what impacts veterinarians, pet owners, and basically all animal lovers in the galaxy as humans. We are your hosts. I'm Dr. Jen the Vet. And I'm Dr. Jason Chatfield. If you've not yet subscribed to our show, why not? Just go to chatfieldshow.com and subscribe today. If you want to reach us, you can find me with any message of love and positivity at jen at chatfieldshow.com. And for all the other messages, you can find me at jason at chatfieldshow.com. Okay, today uh, we are going to be talking about something I think is really important to Whoa. all animals. Whoa. Well, actually, everyone, everyone on the planet, of course. Well, right. Well, I'm saying whoa, though. That means you're supposed to stop talking. Whoa. Whoa. Uh, what? 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 For those of you that are watching the video, you know what I'm talking about. For those of you that are just listening to the audio, I'm going to tell you right now. Dr. Jen, Dr. Jen Devet has on a beautiful, beautiful, but very, very large hat. Why are you wearing a hat indoors? What's happening? Well, <clears throat> thank you so much for noticing and for um, complimenting my hat. I love my beautiful. hat. That's yeah, lovely. Yeah. So the reason that I have it on is because I just came from an excellent weekend of seeing some incredibly beautiful horses. I mean, uh, it was so spectacular. That makes sense. Friends. That makes sense. Yeah. Well, because when you're looking, as everyone knows, Jason, when you're looking at fancy horses, you must wear a... A big hat. Fancy hat. All right. So yes. this is getting way off subject here, but do, do the dudes wear hats or just the, just the ladies? Uh, I mean, some guys wore hats, but they, of course, were not so large as mine. But anyway, well, the, the point of this all is not to talk about. Wait, wait hold what? on. I want to know. Do they like baseball hats, like derbies? Like, what are they wearing? No, no. They wear like nice hat, like, you know, not baseball caps, Jason. Okay. okay. Right. You got to class it up just to just. Okay. I'm just wondering if I could make it over there now. Okay. Carry on. Carry on. Okay. Explain to us why you're wearing a hat and how it relates to today's episode. Well, the reason that I um, have my hat on is uh, number one, I love an excuse to wear a giant hat. Mm. And number two, um, to remind me, because we're going to be talking about disaster preparedness and horse owners like have, have a particularly tricky situation when we talk about disaster preparedness. And in fact, there was a study that was done in the UK recently because, you know, we had a natural disaster called the pandemic. And uh, in the UK, it turned out the majority of horse owners were unprepared, woefully unprepared for disaster. Wow. I like the relation. That was very good. Very good segue. Yes, a segue and a lovely yeah. excuse to wear my hat. But I can't wear it for the whole um, episode. What? I can't. All right. I can't, I can't, I can't. Look, look, okay. I love it. Okay. If you have a horse in the UK, you apparently most likely were not prepared for any sort of pandemic. That's what you're telling me. That is correct. That is okay. correct. So um, now I'm going to break a Dana Perino rule and I'm going to take a hat off on camera. Oh, that's So I can put my scary. headphones on. <laughs> okay. Well, we're all watching. Let's go. We need to get a drum roll. I know. It's the trials. It is. It's the trials and tribulations of being a podcast host right, I um, when you want to wear your beautiful giant hat. Um, and you to don't want to wear it the entire issues, episode. I don't right? know why you don't wear it the whole episode. It looks great. Well, I mean, I can't wear it the whole episode. All right. All right. Got your hat off. Back to being serious. Disaster preparedness. Let's yes. go. Disaster preparedness as it relates to what? Being a person, being a, being a pet owner, being a veterinarian, all the above. What are you, what, what's, what's happening here? Well, as a friend of mine reminds me routinely, disasters happen to everyone, right? So they disasters do. happen mm -hmm. to good people. Disasters happen to bad people. Disasters right. happen to criminals. Disasters happen to honest people. Um, no one is immune from the impact of a disaster. And if you don't know that after the blip called 2020, you've been living under a very giant rock. Okay. Correct. So um, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, I find helpful, as you know, is data yeah you love you love data that's for sure i do love data not the not the android but maybe him too but you're, we're not talking about that 
I mean, who who's not a Star Trek fan, right? right? Okay. So uh, what, I, what I do want to talk about is throw some numbers at people who are thinking right now, like, oh, for heaven's sakes, is this going to be like another show where people try to tell us all about how we're not prepared? And, you know, we should all have like a, a bunker somewhere with tons of canned chili or something. No, this is not that. Right, Jason? Right. Because canned chili doesn't even sound very good. This is about being prepared, but maybe not that prepared. Yeah. And so and maybe what, not for that kind of disaster. I don't I don't know. Yeah. So not only uh, what can happen, but so what, like what, what can you do? What are some steps that a reasonable person can take to be prepared as a pet owner, as an animal lover um, and just as a human who wants to better survive um, natural disasters? Right. So I, I want to be all of those. I mean, who doesn't, right? Who doesn't? So Jason, uh, mm -hmm. I know you've been, so for our, all the folks who don't know, the chat room is located. Well, metaphorically it's located wherever you are, but, mm. uh, for real in IRL in real life, it's located in Florida, which is, you may know is a peninsula, which is prone to dum, dum, dum. big storms. Hurricanes, yeah. right. hurricanes, and actually hurricane season is almost upon us. And so it's always a great time to um, discuss hurricanes and all those sorts of things. So we're going to be slightly hurricane centric, um, spoiler alert, but I think that, but, that but that's okay because I think everything we're going to talk about uh, can pertain to just about, just about anything, right? Because the idea is to be prepared, not necessarily prepared specifically, but you never know what's going to happen. So most of the stuff we talk about, yes, we're going to relate to hurricanes because that's where we are, but uh, you know, it can be for just about anything. Don't you, wouldn't you agree? I would hundred percent agree. Yeah. hundred percent agree. And that's why I say don't tune out just because you live in like landlocked um, Nebraska. Yeah. Right? I was going to go with Iowa, but okay. Okay. All right. So anyway, don't don't tune out just because of that. And don't tune out just because you live on that um, other coastline, the Pacific Coast, which is beautiful, um, but not so prone to hurricanes. Um, so anyhow, and I guess I should qualify it and say that the Atlantic hurricane season is almost upon us. Correct. Um, right. We are, we are, yes, that's right. We are worldwide, actually. So. I mean, that's us world, worldwide podcasters. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So Jason, so uh, tell me like, like why? Cause I know that in the last few years you've become my brother who is much more prepared for mm. different events. So what caused you to kind of up your game, so to speak? Yeah. So I don't know if I up any, any game, right. I just didn't like the feeling. And so uh, what, what had happened was um, what had uh, happened? I, was I moved to Florida one year, right? Like we moved, I moved in, in August, right? I had no idea what's happening. Um, this is 2000 something. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so, and, and not, not just Florida, but, but, you know, central Florida off, off, off the coast, and we all know what can happen there. And it just so happened to be middle of hurricane season. I didn't know what that was coming from Texas, just, you know, just out of school. I was like, yeah, mm -hmm. who cares? Um, and then sure enough, like three weeks after, after uh, I moved to, to, Florida, not, not only did a hurricane hit, it hit directly on um, the property. I was actually taking care of a property with a whole bunch of animals, like a, you know, 5,000 uh, sort of exotic antelope um, animals anyways, and, and directly over it. And when I say we were hit by the hurricane, not, not peripherally, uh, the eye of the hurricane literally went over the property. I sat, I stood outside through the eye um, uh, and which, which if anyone knows and you can't, can't help but know nowadays, you know, the, 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 the wind around the eye is the most intense and it's extremely intense. Anyways, so I went through that more or less mentally, physically, everything else unprepared, had no idea uh, what kind of what kind of disaster that could that could be. So ever yeah. since then, um, you know, I try to be a little bit more prepared. I mean, we were the typical story. We we're out of power for like eight weeks. Um, and let me I tell don't, you, I, learn Jason, about, I, I don't think that's typical. Eight oh, weeks well, without power. In the United a, States, right. I don't think it's typical. Well, to be, to be fair, it was one of the it was the beginning of this crazy hurricane situation we had seemingly every year. It was the first one in a very long time that was that big. It was Hurricane Charlie. I think it came ashore as a Category Four, it may have been barely a five. I don't really know. It was very small, but like a buzzsaw just kind of ripped up everything, and nobody, not just 
not just me, but nobody seemingly was prepared, including the energy and all that and gas and all that. Well, it, it didn't matter if you were prepared for Charlie because you got a second to, as a community, take a breath. Cause then like the next week you were hit by another hurricane. Right. And right. then well, wait, and not just the second one. Then you had a third hurricane. Right. And then wait, right. another giant named hurricane four total, I think came ashore in like a six or eight week span of time. Yeah, it was, it was crazy. And it was my first time down there. So I wasn't prepared. Yeah. And, and uh, to be honest, after the, after the first one, it didn't really mm. matter. <laughs> right. Right. <Like laughs> because you're done. What was, what was messed up was already messed up and you had no power yeah. anyway. So yeah. said, okay, great. Another one. But it was, it was, it was an interesting time. Learned a lot. Um, mm. And ever since then, you know, as it pertains to work, as it pertains to animal care, as it pertains to human, you know, health, mm-hmm. um, sort of pay more, a little more attention. So it's a typical story. Had to experience it myself, went through it, didn't like it. And now things are a little bit different uh, in my life when it gets around uh, that time of year. So. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. So, so we are going to talk a little bit about that. And I, a lot of people who are um, pet owners or animal lovers in the United States, they own, they own businesses, they own small businesses. And so uh, the reason I bring that up is because we, we do have statistics on who survives uh, or like what activities continue following natural disaster impact. Okay. And I'm getting these um, statistics from FEMA. Um, so that, you know, they're arrived on the scene of almost every single, um, disaster of significant impact in the United States. Uh, and so they're pretty, they're universal, I would say these statistics. So, um, 40 to 60% of businesses, small, these are small businesses, 40 to 60% of them do not reopen after a disaster. Oh my gosh. Right. That's almost like the same stat for success of a, of a marriage, right? That's crazy. Right. Right. <laughs> it's it's hard enough to have a small business, let alone a small business going through a hurricane and, and then yes. not survive, or, or, I'm sorry, a, a disaster of any kind and not survive. That is yes. a crazy statistic. Yes. Um, and then um, uh, th- there's a crazy statistic that floats around out there that says like more than 90% of businesses uh, and I think the the caveat is going to be without a plan, but more than ninety percent of businesses will fail within two years following a disaster. Mm. Now that statistic includes things like um, significant data loss. So whether right. like a flood produces the data loss for your business, or whether it is, um, uh, you know, uh, structural impact produces data loss. Or just like a kerfuffle, a hiccup with your server and it melts down because of the data loss. I think that the data loss is significant. So um, that 90% number has to do with data loss. Yeah. It it, it doesn't say it has to be a natural disaster. Any kind of disaster. Uh, 90% is a giant. I I don't know if you understand math enough, but 90% is a pretty big number. I I know a little math. I didn't get the math degree of the two of us. However, I do do know a little math. Um, so, So I think that's interesting. And, and if nothing else, I, I spit out those numbers for people to underscore the fact that you need a plan, right? You don't have to be a business to have a plan. Right. And so, and I will say if everyone hears like Dr. Jason is not on a playground, but school is now out for the year. Yes. I apologize. Uh, we'll take care of that in just a minute, but, um, yes, school is out today. It's interesting. Yes. So we're going to take a break for Dr. Jason to go regulate on the playground that is his wing of the chat room. Yeah, I guess <laughs> and, so. And, and we'll be right back. And what we're going to do uh, after the break is we're going to talk to you about what does a plan look like, who should have a plan, and why you should have a plan. So- With all the fuss happening in the pet food industry, why not invest in something to help guard against digestive health arrangements in your pet? Full Bucket's probiotics are formulated by veterinarians to support your pet's normal digestive health. Your pet's gut microbiome is integral to their immune system performance. Why not add Full Bucket's daily dog or daily cat probiotic powder to your pet's daily routine to curate, protect, maintain, and strengthen your pet's microbiome? Visit fullbuckethelp.com today to check out all of their veterinary strength supplements. Okay, welcome back to the chat room where we are talking about all things disaster, preparedness, impact, and response. Um, 
And as I said, we, we have a little bit of information about that. Um, and we talked about right before the break, how you should have a plan. And actually what I think is hilarious is, um, Jason, did you know that these sorts of plans, the one you should have for a disaster, they have a name. I just thought it was, well, I got my own name for it, but I thought it was just the plan. No, I didn't know they had a, a, an official name. No doubt you're good about to give it to us. I am. No, and, good. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of times that um, pet owners uh, just like they don't realize that they are that important, right? So there is a name and they should have this type of plan. Get ready for it. Wait for it. Poultry lovers. The plan is called a coop. Are you serious? Yes. I didn't understand where you're going with the, with the uh, <laughs> poultry lovers. I don't know, what's a chicken plan? What what's going on here? I don't no, understand that, but it's, it's called a, a coop. I get it. I get it. Coop. All right. Yeah. All right. And so it's a the coop, C O O P stands for continuity of operations plan. And uh, uh, I, like I like to it. say, yeah. And I, you know, we don't discriminate here um, in the chat room. We don't discriminate whatever, whatever type of creature that you love is the one that we love. And so we say here, everyone needs a, a plan, people, pets, and marmosets. Ah, that's yep. good. People, so pets, every, and marmosets. Yeah. Everyone needs a plan. Uh, and it's a coop plan, continuity of operations. And what that looks like for a pet owner is how are you going to continue to provide care and keep your pet alive or your animal. And I think that's where horse owners run into trouble. What do you think? Right. They're a little bit bigger, more, more stuff, just a physical size, I think causes some issues, right? Yeah. And not yeah. every horse owner has a trailer. No, no, they oh. don't. When I owned a horse, I didn't have a horse trailer. You, you owned a horse, please. Yes, of course. I, I didn't did. know you had a horse. I did. Huh? For about a minute, but um, <laughs> no, it was longer than, but but I did. And but I, I bet you knew a guy with a trailer. I did know guys who knew some guys. Yes, yeah, of course, you had to, right? That's my superpower. Of course, I can't ride them everywhere. Right, because I, and that's what I think is funny too. Is it's like it's that like um uh uh what is the name of that that horse of that movie Code Go or whatever? You can't like just get on the back of the horse and run from the disaster. <laughs> All right. Right. Also, those with horses, they may have a trailer, but I doubt they have a trailer for every horse all at once. Correct. Right. Can't Correct. Like that. that's, Plus, that's some that's people have many horses. That might be a mm -hmm. really big truck. Yes, I thought you all meant many, horses. not many. No, many, 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 big, mini. Yeah. Because <laughs> if you have not a mini horse, you can almost put them in the back of the station wagon, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. right. So, uh, yeah. So I think the first key is you don't have to have everything, but you need to know some guys who know some guys. And right. so if you don't keep enough feed, like if you live in like a, a hurricane prone area, or if you live, um, in tornado alley where tornadoes happen, um, you, during those times of year, when those, um, disasters are more likely, then you need to be more prepared. Right. So like for hurricane season, what that looks like is, you should have enough feed at all times available. Now that means maybe at your farm or at your neighbor's farm, you make a deal because they have a, you know, a facility, a place they right. can store it where you have 30 days worth of feed available. Yeah. Because people forget the, uh, the supply chain gets, as we all learned this past year, the supply chain is super important. We just take it for granted that all of a sudden right. we can go get whatever we want. But, but when mm -hmm. that gets interrupted, you know, way on, down the line or previously down mm -hmm. the line uh, stops mm -hmm. you from getting your food. So mm -hmm. uh, you yeah, yep. don't necessarily have, have it at your house is be able to get to yep. it without relying on, you know, delivery trucks or anything like that. So or the feed store being open because right. yeah. <laughs> being able to drive there. I mean, seriously, yeah. but so. just even if you can drive there, feed store might be closed. Right. Welcome. Thanks right. COVID. We all learned that, right. I could get to the feed store, but it was, it was closed. Mm. Right. And um, you know, it's, it's one thing to say all that if you have horses, especially if you have horses, that go to events where I might get to wear my fancy hat. But if you have um, uh, a creature, if your pet has a sensitive stomach, you know how important maintaining their same diet is um, because no one wants to deal with raging enteritis during ever, a ever. disaster. <laughs> yeah. But, or ever. You know, during a disaster. So like if you have a little poodlet and they, you know, when the phases of the moon change, the, the, your poodle gets HGE or, or, uh, pancreatitis flares up or something like this. Hey, Hey friend, 
maybe have a little bit of extra food on hand for that poodleette during whatever your disaster season right. is. Right. You don't you don't you don't have a poodleette, but you got a a new little love bug there. So do you do you, Dr. Genevet, have 30 days worth of food? For cozy? Yeah. For the farm fresh Frenchie. Yes. Um yes. Yeah, so luckily she has like the iron stomach. Um <laughs> got, got plenty of stuff she can eat then. She could eat anything, but she, but I want her to stay on her appropriate mm-hmm. diet if possible. Now, in the end, you can make decisions differently, right? Like, what is the the axiom we say? Uh, you can survive for three minutes without air, for three days without water, and for thirty days without food. Um, but I don't, I don't know who says that, but it sounds true, right? Um, but like, we don't want to test that. Three minutes without air to be hard. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> I'm just saying like, it's the threes, you know, it's like pigs, the pig gestation, three months, three weeks, three days. Right. So anyway, but if you have goats and pigs, that brings up another thing. If you have goats and pigs, you know, having the feed on hand, maybe not as critical because they could eat anything. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's a little different. (laughs) Although I don't recommend that as a veterinarian, please do not hear me recommending as a veterinarian that you feed all kinds of crap to your goats or pigs. But another thing I think is important for people to realize too, is that if you're stressed, your creature is stressed. Correct. But what has that got to do with hurricane storms, uh, disaster preparedness? How can you help but be stressed? What are you well, trying to say? You may or may not know this, but during um, preparations for Hurricane Irma and during Hurricane Irma, it's possible that one lovely young veterinarian that we know in the chat room may have eaten an entire package of Oreos by herself in like a two hour period. It's been known to happen in periods of stress. No, stress no one, eater. no one would have blamed said uh, aforementioned young veterinarian. I know I did. I was so wow. anxious. I was so right. panicked and I didn't even realize it right. until the last couple of Oreos. Yeah, and plus then, Oreos are really good. Yeah. When someone pointed out to me, they're like little, little, little bit of an anxious eater. Mm-hmm. Are we? And I was like, well, stand far away. So I don't hit you when you say that to me at this point in time, because I am anxious, as you may have noticed. But um, yeah, so pets are the same way. They can be anxious eaters. And so all of that anxiety and stress can lead to complications further down the road for your pet that you do not have the time, may not have the resources to deal with because your veterinarian's closed, the emergency clinic is closed. And all of them cost a lot of money if they are open that you don't necessarily have lying about during a disaster. So let's avoid that. So things like probiotics, those are very helpful. Those are helpful for me. Right. And so there are probiotics on the market um, that are helpful for pets. They should be specific to what type of pet you have, but yeah, have those on hand. Um, I think that's a good thing. So you want to have food on hand, your regular diet that your creature eats, whether that's a horse, a cow, a chicken, a pig, goat, or Cosette, the farm fresh Frenchie. You also want to make sure that um, you have uh, probiotics potentially available. Whatever it is that supports your pet's healthy gut, that's what you want to have because that's when they're going to need it the most, right? Um, And then another piece of the plan is where are you going to go? The actual, the actual hurricane evacuation plan disaster plan yeah and it doesn't necessarily have to be just a hurricane so no i know i keep saying hurricane I told you i've been through it I, I'm, I'm like that's yeah. all i think about right so yeah like but you know what if there's some some problem in your area and all of a sudden you're you're like a fire water. yeah oh a fire that's yeah. a, oh yes a fire that's a real deal on the other coast mm-hmm. right yeah every year Every year if there's wildland fires, right? And right. so um, if that happens and you have to bolt from your place, uh, what are you going to do with your creatures? Yeah. You got to take them with you. So you need to have a place to go where where they'll take you. You know, yeah. we don't or have a place to take them. Exactly. We yeah. don't discriminate here in the chat room, but but some places do. And so they don't want your lizard. They don't want your right. snake. They don't want your bird coming with you. So you got to find a place that will like you. Um, and take 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 in you and and your uh, diversified family. Well, the good news is, um, you know, a lot more a lot. There's a lot more uh, tolerance. I don't know if that's the right word uh, for pets nowadays in some of these kind of shelter areas. Um, that, that, and they're and they're really you know good about about that. And it's, they 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 come out and tell you, you can bring your pets, you can do this, or hey, we don't accept your pets here, but go. 
to this place down the road, right? And they will accept your pets. We're just yeah. not ready for it. So it's been it's been in a forethought of uh, of more and more people. So I think that's good. Well, I think I think yes and no, Doctor Jason. Why no? Yeah, I'm going to argue with you about that because I think the idea of accepting people's pets when there's a mandatory evacuation. I think that idea is accepted, but I don't think the actual execution or action of throwing open the doors and accepting people's pets is as good as it could be. Oh, okay. I should say. Yeah. I, so I, I, There's no argument. I think you're probably right. I think that it sounds, yeah, I think the actual practice of accepting, mm -hmm. you know, uh, someone with 14 dogs or whatever probably isn't exactly what, what they had in mind and it's probably mm -hmm. not not, not as accepted as they were, are trying to be, because it, it's difficult, right? There's, there, right. You know, it's, it's like a double-edged sword here. It's difficult. Right. And um, so I think you're making a mistake as a pet owner, if you're depending on someone else, like the government, if you're depending right. on a shelter for people to accept you and your pets, I think that's a mistake. I think you're planning to have a further disaster of your own. And of course, that's just my opinion as Dr. Jen, the vet, but I think that that is a mistake. So you need to find a place that you can go depending on where the disaster is coming from. So that's by that, I mean, just one location is not good. You need to have right. several options so that if one doesn't work out and it need to be outside an area that's likely to be impacted by the disaster as you are. So don't pick your neighbor. <laughs> no, don't pick your neighbor. Pick someone who is a significant distance away from you or significantly um, protected, I would guess, from whatever disaster you're going to look to them for uh, as a secondary location. So yeah, okay, so you're going to get food, you're going to have things to support your pet's gut health, etc. You're going to have a place to go and a way to get there with your pet. I mean, what else do you need to know? Do you need to know anything else? I'm, 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 you, you, you should, right? You should, you should need to know some other stuff. What about medication? Yes. What if your dog's on a chronic medication? Should you have right. enough of that? Sometimes you can't get enough of that. What What should people uh, do about that? That's a tough one, right? Yeah, well, I think every pet should be on medication. It's called preventive medication um, because, I mean, preventive med meds for animals and for humans, frankly, these days are so good and so right. effective. And so, you know, every dog or cat should be on flea, tick, and heartworm prevention. Um and right now people are thinking, okay, doctors in the vet, like that's once a month. So mm, like, really, we're not going to be recovered from something in a month. Well, let me raise, let me raise my hand. Sometimes you're not. Sometimes you're not. What were you just talking about, Jason? Right. Eight weeks, right? Yeah. Well, there's a lot of stuff. It's not just that. I mean, there's a supply chain problem. There's, it's not just you getting in your house with your air conditioning on or whatever. It's just, right. they're just a lot of things that go into getting the product. You know, we're a little bit spoiled with going to the vet or going to the store, or going wherever and just having what we want at hand. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's not that easy. You have to have a, you need to at least think about what, what would I do if I don't have this? Uh, yeah. What are my options? So. And how important is it? Because here's the other key thing that happens with animal owners. And it doesn't matter if you own a big, big animal like horses or if you own um, small animals, companion animals, or if your horse is your companion animal, because that could happen. Um, it doesn't matter. Um, the problem is the same. Right. And what happens is you are so focused, appropriately so, so focused on getting back to what will become your new normal as quickly as possible that things like preventive medication for animals sometimes falls by the wayside. Not, not intentionally. It doesn't make you a bad person, but it does. It does. And so um, the way that I want to help you remember that or realize the importance of continuing the preventive medication is that we usually see the proliferation of uh, vector-borne diseases following natural disasters. Ah, which makes sense, right? Yeah, yeah. So. Um, and one of those things that we see, we see uh, can see a proliferation of tick-borne disease. And so um, while you may not always have a tick problem, for your, your creature, um, all of the things that kind of keep that off the radar for you as a problem for your pet, those may go away. So if you live in an area that aggressively sprays for mosquitoes, well, that infrastructure may be gone for a little bit, right? Yeah. Because everyone else is trying <laughs> to get me, back to normal too. 
Yeah, let me tell you, in Miami, uh, where I used to be, they aggressively spray everywhere, uh, and you reckon you don't recognize it until it's gone, mm -hmm. and then you realize how could people move down here? It's such infested with mosquitoes; it's so wet. But they didn't spray for a while, and yep. uh, you know, you notice you didn't go outside, and so all yep. those vector-borne diseases. Um, I don't know, but I imagine there's an increase down there uh, in the yep. in the fall. And that's one of the myths about natural disasters is people say, oh my God, they're usually people are petrified of a, of an epidemic, an outbreak of, you know, infectious mm -hmm. disease happening and the natural disaster by itself does not like, doesn't, doesn't mean you're going to have a massive outbreak of some crazy infectious disease, but it can predispose events and it can produce, um, conditions such that existing diseases in an area can proliferate. But the disaster itself doesn't cause an epidemic. Nope. Like, uh, and the biggest one we talk about is Haiti, right? They had an earthquake in Haiti. Right. Earthquakes don't bring about epidemics. Like infectious disease, earthquake, those things are not causally related. But what earthquakes, like what happened in Haiti, do is bring help. So the international community responded, right? Unfortunately, an international aid worker, it, introduced cholera into Haiti. Ah, is that, that's what happens. I think that's not necessarily a known, a known thing. I mm -hmm. think you're right. I think most people assume causation, right? Right. And with, it's not with true. Earthquake, broken water lines, all kinds of crazy stuff happen and bad, right. bad hygiene that must be caused by the earthquake and, and all this other stuff. But that's not, you're telling me that's not what happened. No, no. It was introduced by someone with good intentions. Sure. Right. Sure. Um, but, but maybe not the smartest thing at that point. Yeah. So, so, um, so that's, so that is like, people don't even realize that they associate a natural disaster with some sort of epidemic of infectious disease when those things are not tied together. If you have a hurricane or, or a fire or an earthquake or something like this, a volcanic eruption, those things do not bring a, they're not, they don't cause an outbreak, uh, or an epidemic but they could be associated with one because of subsequent events. And so for pets, that's very true. We will see the exacerbation of underlying issues. So underlying issues could be if you live in a, in a heartworm endemic area, then a lot of times about six months after any sort of natural disaster, we see an um, increase in heartworm cases because people forgot to can, you know, stick to their schedule. Maybe they religiously were giving their heartworm prevention and they stopped because, hey, bigger fish to fry, right? right so course. they got off their schedule. So what yeah. I'm saying is guard against that as a, as a responsible um, uh, chatterbox who's an animal lover, uh, guard against that. And just put it on your list, your list of things that you need to make sure that you're prepared for with your with your creature. But tick-borne Wait, disease... hold on. You, you brought up a list. Oh. I we think... should talk about that because that's probably important. Because that, oh. we're talking about a lot of things and it's starting to get to be quite, quite a few. Um, and mm -hmm. those, of, those of us down here on the peninsula that feel exposed every, every fall yeah. probably have a list, right? But maybe not everybody. Um, a list to do, okay, we have this coming blah, blah, blah. We have a, ch a checklist of a punch list or a checklist of things to worry about. Yep. Um, you recommend that people have that for, for yeah. their pets. Oh yeah. Don't like for themselves, but also for their pets. Yeah. Like don't try to remember everything. Gosh, heaven help the poor like person who memorized something and forgets one item. Right. right. It's just, <laughs> there's no need for that. Like it doesn't make you cool. Like it's not like the, you know, the universe gives you extra points if you just memorize it. Yeah. Write um, it down. So write it down and make sure everyone knows it. Mm. Um, and then, you know, like when um, tornado season, although tornadoes can happen at any time, but, you know, they happen more often during certain Correct. times of the year. Mm. Like So during tornado season, during fire season, if you're on the Pacific coast, get those things together in a pile or at least mentally do the mental exercise of going over, where did I put that last time? so that you know where it is and mm -hmm. make the list. So the list is how much feed do we have? It's like a checklist. And there's a lot of them out there. You can find a lot of different checklists for animal owners, um, depending on what type of creature you have. Yeah. Pick one of those, pick one of Fair. those lists. And get Someone's already done the work for you. Just, just yeah. get a list, yeah. go through it, make sure you're covered. Um, the other Think thing is, it. Hey, Hey, you could ask your veterinarian. What? Yeah. You could Imagine ask your veterinarian. That. Yeah. 
Yeah, they have resources with lists that they can help tailor for your pet. So, or your creature. I keep saying pet, but people, I mean that in as in whatever species that you love or that you uh, provide care for. So, uh, definitely an issue. But Jason, some people can't leave. Yeah, they cannot. Mm -hmm. Because they have a farm. They can't leave. They have a farm. Okay. We hear you. We see you. Hey, we are you. (laughs) We can't leave either. This is true. So it's a little bit different. So your preparation list, if you have a situation where unless you are facing significant bodily injury, you can't leave. So you need to start your preparations a little bit earlier and they're going to be a little bit more labor intensive. So a little bit, a little bit, but you can have your list because to me, taking action alleviates anxiety. If I can't take action, then my action is eating Oreos. So uh, (laughs) this this is not a good, a good scene for me. So make your list, talk to your neighbors because you don't have to have the tractor. If you know a guy right? and he knows that, you know, you're going to rely on him with his tractor um, that sort of thing. Those are what we call um, in the professional world, wait for it, mutual aid agreements. Yeah. I like it. Can you just say ma? Ma. <laughs> you, could, you could just say ma, right? which might, might be confused with a sheep. Yeah. It's a mutual aid agreement. Yeah. Uh, Figure out what you're going to do. I mean, it's all part of the plan. If you, if you know you can't leave or it takes a major, major situation for you to have to leave because you have so many other creatures uh, mm-hmm. relying on you, which yep. is essentially what you're saying. You have many yep. other creatures that you have to, okay, then the onus is on you and you got to, mm-hmm. you got to take care of it, but it's not, not that big of a deal. Uh, mm-hmm. If you, if you prepare and mm-hmm. eating Oreos, isn't really preparing, but make a list, think about, think about it. Um, and, and try to be as prepared as you can. Cause that's pretty much what the only thing you can do Yeah, right? is be as prepared as you can. But if you yeah. ignore it, I promise you, you're not prepared and it's no fun. Yep. hundred percent, hundred percent. So we do know vector borne diseases will proliferate. So you want to make sure you have the best, uh, prevention, um, that you probably have them on all year round. I hope cause you're an informed pet owner if you're a chatterbox, um, and, uh, talk to your vet about that. Um, The other thing um, that I just want to make sure that people know is that if you don't have any of this, and this is like the first time it's sort of coming on your radar, that's really okay. That's okay, right? Maybe you didn't know. It doesn't matter when you get prepared, right? Just go ahead and do it. It doesn't matter if you're late late to the game. Just get get it done before it happens. Better to be prepared before than than try to figure it out after. I promise. That's right. And there's a lot of resources available these days, right? Starting with, oh, you're veterinarian. Um, talk with them about what, what they recommend. So uh, the other thing is I want to like make you feel normal as a barometer. Almost 75% of businesses don't have a plan. Yeah, that's it. That, you know, that coming again, coming from Southern Florida, that seems a little crazy to me. Right? It's true, it seems, but it's true. Not like crazy. They're crazy for not having a plan, but that's that's just a, it's a really high number for someone to mm-hmm. say, ah, whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's a lot of businesses and places that don't necessarily have um, the situation that 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 we have down here. Sure. Um, where we have a little bit of, of warning, right? I mean, but well, still, every year we get to practice. I mean, every year we get to practice, but I mean, there's <laughs> tornadoes and hur- I mean, yes. hurricanes and fires and yes. earthquakes. And I don't know anything about this, but I guess there's nor'easters. I don't even know what those are. They sound yeah. cold. Why, why yeah. people would live up there? I don't know, but that's, that's great. People yeah. like it. Yeah. There's something everywhere you live, right? Hopefully it has a season. Uh-huh. So, uh, so, so Dr. Jason, you've been through a bunch of uh, storms and stuff. So mm-hmm. like, what is your, what's your go-to story? Like your funniest story? Because when you have a place that has a ton of animals, like wh- you can't right. leave, like, what do you do? So what's your funniest story? Well, I have I have several funny funny stories. Most of them I probably shouldn't tell uh, even on, on the podcast uh, we because they were that. they were more like okay, you weren't prepared for that. Didn't have any of that, um, and no one thinks about it. Although almost mm-hmm. everybody thinks about it now is is toilet paper, but we won't go into that. Um, so the funniest it's not funny, right? Um, but but you 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 think about um, you know the first place I was at again, so because we were just not prepared. I mean, I wasn't prepared. Uh, mm-hmm. with the exotic exotic ranch um you know and a hurricane really just kind of blew blew over it um everyone was sort of all the fences were down i mean 
80, something like 80% of the fences were down. Luckily we're on like 8,000 acres, but it's not, it's not necessarily funny, but it's, it's a good story and it makes you feel good. But, but you, you realize these animals are dependent on, on you. Right. Um, and so a lot of people were, were, were kind of really worried the animals were going to disperse and be in, be in the, you know, the, the, the native environment and lost forever and go breed and set up stuff. Well, no, guess what they wanted. They wanted food. Right. And they're so used to getting food that the first thing we did was not, was not go put the fences up. That was like, not, not what we did. It was go put the normal, everyone likes the routine, including your pets and including whatever animals you're taking care of. So we would go put all of the food down. And guess what? 95% of the animals said, oh, okay, interesting weather we're having. Where's my breakfast? And they all came up. And then as they came up, then we could work on putting, you know, making the area secure. So I don't know if that's a funny story, but it, it's sort of not not necessarily what you would think about doing first is putting putting the food down before you take care of uh, securing the the place. So, but I, but I will say that that is the exception. That place is the exception. The majority of people who have any sort of non traditional creatures, number one, they're required um, by law by the government mm-hmm. to have a plan of action, and that plan includes um, securing the creatures in place despite any disaster, so that they do not escape. Right. Um, and uh, furthermore, um, the majority of people who have those animals have them in such a way that they can actually secure them in smaller places um, so that whether the fences are damaged or not, those animals are not escaping. So I would say probably um, that place not having that situation might have been in the, like less than 1%. Um, yeah, so it doesn't the, matter. It's what happened to me, right? So yeah, that, the, that's my story. And and I would say that putting putting the food down and getting the animals up would fall into securing the animals, right? That can mean a lot of, a lot of different things. Getting, getting your eyes on the animals for sure was, was important. Um, so yeah, I, w- yeah. I would say that you're right. In most places, like, like say a, a typical, you know, uh, suburban zoo can't just, can't just do that, but, but you know, they're, they're probably not going to run into the same, the same sort of issues. Right. And so, um, yeah, so it's really not an issue if you have someone in your community who has non-traditional uh, animals, don't, don't, don't be concerned. It's unlikely that they're elevating any threat for you um, following a disaster because the majority, and I, I mean, I never say 100%, but like 99.9% of those people have a method where whether or not the fencing is uh, damaged, they will contain those animals. So it's not necessarily um, a, a routine um, threat following disaster or one that you should concern yourself with in your larger community. Plus, um, this was like a major, major storm that hit directly on, I mean, directly on this place. And that doesn't happen very often. You know, most of the fences in, in these kind of places are made to withstand these kind of things. So, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think what is also interesting is that a lot of places that have um, different creatures, they might spend three hours just catching every single bird <laughs> imagine if you had to go and catch every single bird and put them in a in a box because then a they more then, secure yeah place. so that if the if the damage does happen they're safe and then you can quickly repair that and put them right back out as soon as the storm passes so yeah and and i think it is true that those animals a lot of times they sense there's something happening because they can sense the barometric pressure changes etc and the same thing with fire so when fire is approaching, like, I think it's an instinctual thing. Animals are afraid of fire. Well, yeah, they kind of, they kind of have their own anxiety. So uh, yeah. bir- birds, like flocking birds, you can tell, like, wait, like a bunch of flamingos. They, if a hurricane's coming, right, they're out in the middle of the water. Uh, oh, but if yes. fire, it probably gone. Right? right. They know what a fire means. Woo! Yes, so. exactly. Exactly. So, so we encourage everyone to uh, get a plan, people, pets, and marmosets. Um, and there are lots of places. So we'll drop some links in the show notes um, for folks, for places that we know you can go get some solid advice um, to start your list, to start your list of making sure you have feed or food available for a month. Make sure you have all your preventive medications I mean, get some probiotics, have those available because I'm going to tell you the biggest derangement that happens is a stress enteritis. I don't care what kind of creature it is. So the happier and healthier you make that gut, the happier and healthier you will be if you have to evacuate or not. Hmm. Um, so that's it. And then you want to make sure that um, you've got a good place to go. If you, ha- if you have to go, 
uh, somewhere. So those are those are our kind of our top tips for your right. So I I know we don't know. I have I have one more that when 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 we did this I found to be very interesting. Um, okay, is communication and everyone says oh I have a phone oh. tree I have a phone tree and. Good and I, everyone tells me that I see that's the biggest mistake people can make is have a phone mm-hmm. tree where it's one to one to one. You need to have like a, the idea is right, but you probably should have like a phone bush, right? Where yeah. I'm calling four people and my friend Tom is going to call four people, two of which are the same that I'm right. calling. So you have some right. redundancy because if one link in the chain or whatever in a tree is broken, you're done. But just to help each other out. What was that? What was that? Ma, ma, mutually assisted mutual aid, or whatever. aid agreement. Yeah. So it's, it's really good. You can kind of help each other out and put yeah. those phone numbers where on your list, where you can call these people um, and, yes. and talk about stuff and say, Hey, I have this, I have this, you can kind yes. of help each other out. So, yes. And, um, and I'll say this in the chat room, chatterboxes, if you guys want more information about all this kind of stuff, like if you want us to talk about um, the specific diseases that may occur, et cetera. Hey, send us an email because Dr. Jason and I can chatter on about disasters for For a long time. Yeah. We only, we probably only covered a very, you know, little bit of it and there's a lot more to it. Um, Yep. But, but yep. And like, you know, because it is that time of year here. So. Yeah. Like what, and what do you do when, because I think recognizing some first aid and trauma things that you can do as a, as an informed animal owner safely, where you're not going to cause a bigger problem, but you can start to mitigate some of the um, injury to your creature. I, I think those things are useful, but send us an email. Let us know. Um, because again, because we, we like it and we've lived it. We love to talk about it. So let us know if you want to hear more about that sort of thing. Um, otherwise, what are you doing? Turn the podcast off and go out and get a coop. Go out and get yourself a plan. That's get right. started. That's right. Go get a coop. Yeah. <laughs> Work on yeah. it. <laughs> right. Embrace your inner poultry lover and get a coop. Um, so that that's I think that's all we have today for this for this uh, discussion. Um, right. That and um, everyone should have a fancy hat. At least one. I was going to say, let's talk about the hat again. That was great. We should, really everyone should have hat. at least one. Yeah. At least one. All right. And shout out to Erica, my friend who also has the same love for a fancy hat and horses. So, all right. I'm, I'm Dr. Jen. And I'm Dr. Jason Chatfield. And we'll see you guys the next time when you join us in the chat room. This episode of Chats with the Chatfields is brought to you by Full Bucket Veterinary Strength Supplements. 